So without further ado, I am Carolyn Brandon with the Georgetown Center. We're gonna go ahead and quickly introduce each person on the panel. We have the privilege of being the closing discussion and trying to pull together both some of the technical points that we heard discussed on the first panel and some of the business implications that were discussed on the second panel. And then we're gonna to try to boil all that down and have it make sense for policymakers and, and regulators. So, oh, no problem. Oh, I didn't tell you that's what we were talking about? Sorry. <laughs> So we have Kathleen Abernathy, former FCC Commissioner and Counsel at Wilkinson Barker, each of our old firm. It was an, our old firm, collectively, right? Jamie Hastings, who runs government affairs, state government affairs at CTIA. Thank you, Jamie, very much for being with us. Tamara Priest, who does global public policy at Verizon, and Morgan Reed, president and founder of the App Developers Association. Thank you all for being here. Um, Okay, so we're just gonna start with a large question and I would love to get each of you to react to it, which is what sort of policy issues do you guys think actually need to be addressed sooner rather than later so that the sort of reality that we heard about on the first panel with this massive densification and the unbelievable ca both capacity and low latent latency um, aspects of 5G that will make unbelievable use cases possible, what are the policy issues that have to be fixed first? And, and, and Morgan, I know you like to spice it up. It's perfectly okay to say you don't see any policy problems, although I don't think that's <laughs> I don't where think you I'm land. Say that today. Well, I'll jump in this. Please, Jamie. <laughs> um, Jamie's so thanks, Carolyn. I, I, I am living this. My team is living this. I, I think, you know, one of the things that, that we have to sort of do is baseline this when, when we're talking to public policymakers. And um, CTI commissioned a report um, by Accenture earlier in the year, and 5G is going to create 300 million new jobs, 500 billion in contract. I'm sorry, did I hear somebody? Debbie, we can hold our questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 500 billion? Three million. In, it was 3 million, I think. Oh, excuse me. Did I say 300 million? Yeah, yes. but it, well, I'm off to a great good. start. Which is why the communications <laughs> workers is, is, is okay, what sorry. Is 3 million. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's go with 300 million. Really it's excited. such a better number, don't you think? <laughs> 3 million is still a pretty big right. number, ladies right. and gentlemen. <laughs> um, 500 billion in contribution to GDP and 167 billion in smart city benefits. So, when when we're talking about public policy, we always have to bear in mind, you know, that the types of legislation that we're looking at, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, these these pieces of legislation and these conversations have to be about jobs and economic development. So here's the problem. Currently, there is not a regulatory regime for these small cells. There is a regulatory regime for macro sites, which are 150 feet, um, we've all seen them. Um, they are obviously very different aesthetically from these kinds of installations. And the process for approval in the localities is built around those macro sites. So oftentimes it can take anywhere from 18 to 24 months. There's no ability to bundle applications. It can be extremely expensive. And so what we're trying to do, and I am the state person, um, what we're trying to do in the states, but there are conversations taking place um, both at the FCC and on the Hill, is establish regulatory certainty and with respect to small cells. And that regulatory certainty is not just for the industry but it's also for these communities. So they're struggling with this because our members are walking in and they have 60 applications. And the community looks at it and says, well, well, these 60 applications, these usually take two years to process. Well, we can't do this. So there are three principles that we've looked at and that we um, are pursuing in the states. One is access to rights of way and what we call city furniture, like street lights. The other is reduced cost because we have experienced, our members have experienced um, just extraordinarily high costs to place these in, on you know, city furniture, if you will. And then finally, streamlining 
for example, bundling of applications. 12 states have enacted small cell legislation and are in effect in 12 states. And I think the most important thing, the thing that I'm most proud of that, that our members have done is each one of those bills is different. We, our members, have been working very, very closely with local communities. And so we're not just walking into a state and saying, here's our bill, put the name of your state at the top of it. Um, our members are working with local communities to address their concerns. On the previous panel, we talked a little bit about aesthetics, you know, making sure that it fits into the community. Every single one of those pieces of legislation give power to the local community over the look of these small cells. I could talk all day long. <laughs> These she poor could. people, I could, <laughs> um, especially about this, but I will stop there. The 300 and million jobs are all of the state people who have to go out <laughs> and work with all of the but I, I think And I fully support yeah. that, by the way. So, yeah, Tamara and Morgan, please jump, yeah, jump I, in. Yeah, I, I actually think, though, we're, we're identifying a... Um, a danger of the way we talk about it. Um, you opened it up with three million jobs um, that would be created and, and money that would be spent on the build out. But, okay, I'm gonna do a quick make sure. Does everybody in the room have a smartphone? Show of hands if you do. No. If you do, do not have a smartphone. Anybody not have a smartphone? Great. How many of you are on average more than three feet away from your smartphone? Don't put up your hand because you're actually not. Statistically speaking, you're never more than three feet away from your smartphone. <laughs> um, do you think you would like it if your smartphone was, uh, if, your, if the content on your smartphone came faster to you? All in favor of faster? Show your hands. <laughs> do you think that's what most Americans want? Faster, better, closer to them, gives them more of what they want? Jobs are important, and I think that for you it's an important message, but I think what we're all doing in this room is we're offering a future, a hope, a plan. People are inherently selfish, and that's not a bad thing. What do the people in this community want? They want cooler videos, faster. They want more channels where they want it. They want fixed wireless. They don't even know that term, but they want more and they want it now. And I think when we talk about the jobs created and the opportunities built, we need to paint a picture of a better, more interesting uh, future for the people who live in those cities. And so when you're walking in and handing somebody 60 applications, what you're really saying is this is the pathway to the dream for your constituents, for the things that they want. And I think when we do that, when we, and, and it's not a knock, we all fall into that trap of heads down and how do we get through it. But uh, we heard the last panel about how much money do we make and where do we come up with it and how does it all go. But we're in the business of selling a dream. And we already have that dream in our pocket in the smartphone that you've got. So what we've got to do to help break some of those log jams is remind, remind those city officials that that's what we're in the business of doing. And it's not just 3 million jobs, it's actually, truthfully, 300 million jobs. Because all Americans, nearly all Americans, are looking for ways to benefit from it. And I think that so I agree with you. You're right about the policy implications. I think we all have to remember that that's what we're selling. So I completely agree. Um, I, I'm just saying that when you're talking yeah, to yeah. policymakers, it, and 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 it's true. I mean, this is you know, um, these are facts. Now I have pages of interesting data. <laughs> so we at CTA love our data and our statistics. Um, but you're absolutely right. I completely agree that we do need to talk about those smart city benefits and how it benefits the consumer in terms of, you know, transportation and public safety. Totally get it. Tell them how they how, to sell them a dream, because that's what we all want to know. And I think that's right. So data's great, um, but stories are really valuable. So I think I've got great they, stories. Exactly, and that's the thing we got to remember. All right, Tamara, can you jump in and, and from an operator perspective, maybe give a little bit more color and context for ways in which these citing issues, whether it's the duration of the process or the cost that they're trying to come up with, you know, granted, we understand where the localities are coming from. They read the stories, they see a cash register, right? They're, okay, we're gonna, yeah. we're gonna fill in our budget deficit on this, this, and this by charging these guys something. So we absolutely understand the motivation. But on the other hand, it has real world consequences for the companies trying to get 5G out there. Tamara, can you? Sure, I mean, I'm really, it, the number of regulatory regimes that apply to wireless siting 
it's just mind-numbing. I mean, it's not just the local zoning and permitting and access to municipal rights of way and access to the poles in those rights of way. There's also environmental review. There's historic preservation review. There's tribal review. Some of those are federal regimes. A lot of those are local regimes. And all of them apply almost everywhere you want to go. Well, maybe, I mean, the tribal and historic preservation, you have to get past it, but it may not apply. But you have to, it can take two years just to get all the tribes to tell you that it doesn't affect them and they're not interested. And if you're spending two years trying to get in a right away or, to, or uh, nine months to get on a poll, then you're spending money, you're incurring costs, and you're not providing service. And that's just very hard for the bottom line. It's hard to, you're trying to tell these wonderful stories, and we're trying to do that. We're sitting down, and it's great if you have a mayor or a city manager who gets it and will be excited about the things that you're going to bring to the citizens there, their constituents. But if it's taking you years just to get there, then it, there's a little bit of a mismatch between what you're promising and um, the, the pretty picture you're painting and what you actually are doing at that particular time. Um, the other thing is it's not, yes, we have municipalities that have their hands out and see this as a way to balance budgets, but they also have, and we are the first to acknowledge, they have legitimate concerns. I mean, they do have aesthetic concerns. I mean, nobody wants a refrigerator on the telephone pole in front of them. But, you know, we need to explain that they're not refrigerators. Um, they, there are going to be concerns about about safety, that they are going to be concerned about multiple providers. They've got Verizon's handing them a stack of applications today, and they've got AT&T handing them a stack of applications tomorrow, and how is all that going to work? So there are legitimate concerns. So I really think um, the way Jamie put it is to help the localities, help the municipalities come up with model ordinances, model state codes that they can then you know, tailor for their particular circumstances would give them a starting place. Um, we're never interested in going in and making enemies of the people we're trying to serve. We're serving the mayor as well as his constituents or her constituents, as the case may be. So we understand we're repeat players. But <coughs> it's just an awful lot to go through all of this every time. And so what we need is not the federal government to say, the rate has to be this, and the time period has to be that, though in some cases we like the shot clock. <laughs> but a, a more establish some bounds on it that, you know, whether it's a $50 application or a right-of-way fee or a $60 one is different than if it's a $10,000 one, right? And so we, we kind of want to have some guideposts or real sort of that people will know that if you're in here, we can work with you because that's what we want to do. We want to get in and work with you. But the burdens are, are great. I, I also want to say, and I, we can come back to this later, but it's, I, I think we're going to hear a lot of infrastructure, 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 but to be so I won't be completely boring. There are other things out there. There's tax policy, I mean, corporate tax reform, encouraging investment in CapEx, um, bringing down the top corporate tax rate. Fiber deployment. Um, you want to deploy new technologies. You need to be able to stop you need to be able to retire or discontinue old services. And for a company like Verizon with a big eye like Footprint, you know, that's a big issue for us as well. So there are, you know, there are any number of different things besides infrastructure, though infrastructure is certainly the you know, day glow, big letters, that's the big problem. So I want to um, build on that because, and, and Kathleen, I'll turn to you because you have such a long history um, with a brief detour into wired, but in the wireless space. Mm -hmm. Um, where do you think spectrum policy fits into uh, this discussion as an issue that should, you know, be addressed? Does it not? Is everything kosher? Um, and here I'm, I'm thinking of the a little bit of a disconnect between the conversation we were having at dinner last night and sort of this thought that, you know, any amount of spectrum you can get is going to be used and your capacity will be filled. So it's not as if everybody has what they need forever right now. There's always going to be a need for more. And all the discussion from the first panel is around the millimeter wave, which, as we know, right. is really just starting to get some focus. So what, what are your thoughts on where spectrum policy fits in? So it's at the core of everything that we do in the wireless arena. And the good news has been that one of the reasons that the US has had a leadership position in the wireless arena and globally has maintained that leadership position all this time, whether it's the technology, the equipment, um, spectrum management, is because of how creative and forethinking or advanced thinking had been exhibited by the FCC when they first started down this path of how do we manage spectrum and why do you care? It's a limited resource. It's no different than uh, managing water or any other kind of limited resource. We've got X amount of spectrum out there and we need to not only manage it domestically but globally so you don't have interference with other countries. We've been fortunate that this 
past FCCs, this FCC, they continually look at how do we manage it to maximize the benefit, to hand it over to the private sector so they can do what they do best. They figure out how to monetize it, how to deliver what consumers want, how to find the next cool thing. What that means, though, is that it's very dynamic. And so you've seen, most recently with white spaces and, and with the reverse auction with media, is that it does require a nimbleness that you don't often see in government to step back and say, all right, how do I repurpose this resource? Because it used to go over into this bucket, but now there's a higher value over in this bucket. And by the way, technology is coming along so that junk spectrum that used to be considered unusable is now very usable, very valuable. And how do we get it into the hands of industries that can tap into those resources and deliver that value? So I think we're fortunate that the FCC has a long history and willingness to try and manage this role in a very creative way to tap into the resources. The one area where I think sometimes there's a bit uh, of naivete around who can really play in this arena, there's always this idea, let's hold an auction and we'll get new players into this wireless world. Well, I would not want to be the fourth, fifth, or sixth player in this arena. This is a tough, tough market. Uh, when I was at Frontier, a wireline company, and continually there were discussions, should we enter wireless? And every time I said, no. We barely managed to make money in the wireless arena when, when we were number three. You want to go in and be number five? No. That's, it's bad economics. And but that's been good for consumers because price has been going down and there's lots of choices. The one thing that's different now with 5G and that where I don't think we've all really, I know I haven't really wrapped my head around this brave new world of 5G, but it's not your mother's same old spectrum where you use it for traditional stuff. This is machine to machine. This is unleashing data in a way that we've never done before to change the way we will be living our lives, whether it's through surgeries, whether it's through um, factory mechanization, whether it's through how you manage highways. I mean, these are pretty much limited, po unlimited possibilities about how this data flow will be managed. And so it, it is critical, I think, that the US continue to maintain its leadership role and why you need to continue to work with the states, because you almost have to tell the states, look, my company has X amount of CapEx, and you can either have it in your state first, or you can be at the back of the bus, because we have you know, this many people who can build it out, this much equipment we can purchase, and you want to drive the value and the benefits to your community, not to a neighboring, you know, not to another state. So, I do think there is this educational layer because this is redefining how we use wireless in a way that we've never done before. So I want to get um, back to a point, Morgan, that you were talking about, which is you know selling the dream. But, but before we do that, it, to both you, Kathleen, and Jamie, and, and Tamara, are there any particular FCC proceedings going on or soon to be going on involving Spectrum that you feel hold a special promise for 5G? Or pretty much as we learned, you know, 5G is not millimeter wave spectrum, and it's not any particular spectrum band. It is the functionality you get across different spectrum yeah, bands. Yeah, I would say so. it, it's all of them. I mean, I don't want to be glib, but that's what it is. It's whether it's high band, it's millimeter wave, it's mid band, it's the 3.7.4.2 NOI, it's 3.5 NPRM that was on the agenda, FCC's agenda yesterday. And that goes just to the point that Kathleen is making, that the FCC has done a very good job compared to, you know, other countries you know, far and away, a fabulous job of being willing to get the spectrum out there and stand back and let um, the operators and the folks who are developing the apps to go on top of it to, to do what they do best. But they really have to remind themselves to continue to be humble about that. Because at the, I mean, when you think about it, at the same time that the FCC was, and of course this is a Verizon pet peeve, I admit that up front, but at the same time the FCC was so worried about the 600 megahertz auction, making sure AT&T and Verizon didn't run away with all the spectrum there and setting up rules to keep that from happening. Verizon was out there looking to acquire millimeter wave spectrum and very involved in the 3.5 rulemaking. And, and so that, that argument that 
that place and time had already passed. They were looking backwards instead of looking forward. So uh, you know, we need to get away from that. And for a while, now we have people saying, oh, it's all millimeter wave spectrum, and don't let Verizon and AT&T get so much of that. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> but but you know at the, now, but it's pretty clear that the midband spectrum is going to be a great platform for 5G. So it, so for the spectrum proceedings, I would say all of them. Thank you, Mark. Oh, I was just gonna. I'll get to the other question, but I think she's exactly <coughs> right. We constantly fall into this trap of of uh, not thinking about where the future actually is and just looking where we are. Uh, we have a policy, essentially, of, as an organization, always asking for more spectrum now. You know, it's kind of in in general because I've never seen us. Uh, I've never seen uh, you know spectrum languishing on the side of the road in in, in true form. There's blocks of it that move forward, but as uh, um, Kathleen ta discussed, TV white spaces is fascinating in what you can do, what you can shove in between places and see if you can make it work. There are technical hurdles that we'll need to overcome. There are aspects about where it where it interfaces, but the idea that, as you described it, junk spectrum becomes something useful and valuable and can really power some of the rural deployment that's really hard to get without it, I think is fascinating. And so I think you're exactly right. If today's, if today's menu is millwave, um, people need to understand that there's going to be something next. And so it's you're right, it's all of it. How do we get it? How do we put it into the use? And how do we make um, a kind of, you know, how do we make interesting things happen with it? Especially with the lag, right? How many yep. years it takes to allocate, assign, and deploy spectrum by the time it's out there. Those of us who have the job of worrying about what's going to be available five or ten years down the road are looking at something right. completely different. Ricevi's written a whole new set of PowerPoints by the time that we're done with that part. <laughs> well, and I, I think uh, what that means, too, <coughs> is that regulators, and mostly at the federal level, since they're the ones responsible for allocating spectrum, I think they have to be pretty flexible about uh, what they do when a company, any company, comes to them and said, I got this spectrum, we got, I got it three years ago, here's what I was supposed to use it for, but let me tell you what you really want me to use yes. it for. Because nothing's been stagnant in those three years. And if I have to do what you want, I'm devaluing what I can do with this. So I don't know how you create the regulatory framework to allow that, but I think it becomes very important because you don't want any of these companies deploying, you know, opening a typewriter repair shop today. You want them thinking, how do I take this spectrum and really maximize the value without creating any harmful interference, without intruding on the spectrum rights of others. So you do want an agency that's willing to rethink when a company comes to them and says, Really, let me explain to you why you need to let me pivot slightly and why that would be good for the country. So let's talk about that sort of fun, you know, what is the art of the possible in the future? Um, and in part, my, my question's motivated by a comment, I think it was made earlier today, which is that this idea of video over mobile, you know, probably not gonna be that real anytime soon, but you know, I look at the way my 10 year old interfaces yes. when I let her, you know, with video on her mobile device, she, she does not watch TV. She does not sit on a couch or chair and watch a big screen. She's doing this and she's watching snippets. So talk to us yeah. a little bit about what's coming out of your world that can leverage off the capabilities of 5G. Well, I think we've all seen it, those of us with children of a certain age. The, the, I mean, you can call it attention span, call it what you want, but the fact that Jake and Logan Paul have millions of dollars, and uh, probably most of you have never heard of them, but trust us, if you've got a tweener, they're huge. Um, they uh, do little tiny video clips and stupid tricks, and yet they burn up enormous amounts of bandwidth for kids who get off the bus and like, what did they post today? And so when you think about that in terms of the video content and just consuming, that's one thing. But then you look at what's really going to have an impact on 5G, and that's the moment that that pops up. How do they react? What do they share on Snapchat on the story? What video do they take of themselves talking with their other friends about it? The, the layer on effects of the way that the mobile apps not just allow you to consume it, but then send it over here, make some comments about it, draw a circle on it, add your own video clip to it, put it on this app, share it with that app, it's up on Insta, oh, it's a picture off of that. Let's turn it into a, into a GIF or a GIF, depending on which way you want to pronounce it. Um, <laughs> all of those things hit that network. They're all going to need an IP address, they're going to need a connection, and again, 
Kids want it. Kids, everybody wants it now, and they want it right on time. And so I think when you look at this question about well, spectrum and regulatory questions, I, I always feel like a lot of it ends up being get out of the way. Uh, we've talked at, in the past about things like you know prioritization and how that works. Well, really what people want is they want what they want when they want it. And I thought, Kathleen, it was really interesting you bring up the medical. So very, I'll try to tell the story as quickly as possible. The leader in telemedicine in the United States is not Stanford, it's not Boston, it's not Chicago, it's not Mayo, it's University of Mississippi Medical Center. That is unquestioned the leader in telemedicine. They have deployed telemedicine to deal with type 2 diabetes and obesity in rural parts of Mississippi at a rate that nobody else has seen. They've seen a 100% reduction in emergency room visits. The whole works. Now, I haven't read much about this because they haven't been doing a lot of published studies. They've just been doing it because the state was running out of money putting these people into helicopters and ambulances to take them two hours because they're in a HIPSA, a healthcare professional shortage area. So when you talk about that, and you look at the uses of that kind of technology to empower a state like Mississippi, who has people in rural and poor areas, and then you say, well, those people may need the packets a little faster than my da da daughter needs her Logan Paul fix. I think we have to understand that what people are really talking about is, how do I have good network management, and how do I have ways to say, oh, I really need this. And if there means that their money has to be attached to that, that's fine. But we have to figure out how do we build a network, and 5G provides a lot of the infrastructure, I think we all agree, to allow people to make smart decisions, both economically and in terms of network empowerment, to do those kinds of things. So that the video, the getting slammed to watch Logan Paul videos, doesn't interfere with the rollout of Mississippi and their ability to serve uh, diabetic patients and people with um, uh, Glu um, continuous glucose monitors. So we've got to find a network solution that solves for both, and I think that involves a lot of regulatory flexibility and getting the hell out of the way. Well, and that touches the third rail of Title II net neutrality, and I do think I didn't that's, say it. I just I'm going to say it because, priority. because nobody okay. likes to I, say I, the I, word. So put aside net neutrality. Put right. that over I didn't here. Say that. Let's talk about Title II. Title II should be gone. It makes no sense anymore. And if you want to unleash both the framework and how you want to use technology and have the right regulatory landscape, you need to think not common carrier title two, you need to think, all right, forget silos anymore. We need to think about this on a bigger basis. Right. We need to think about it from the perspective of do we want some entities being able to have priority? I think the answer is yes. You need to think about uh, do we need to worry about discrimination? Maybe, maybe not. But you can't do that in the when you're tied up in knots over a statutory framework that was designed for a world that no longer exists. So, so I, just to build on that, because I was actually going to raise oh. uh, with surprise that nobody mentioned the Title II, you know, ongoing discussion around Title II and net neutrality as a policy issue that really needed to be resolved. And here I'll reference some research that Peter Rasavi has done um, around ways in which a Title II regime undermines some of the base cases for 5G if in fact you are not able to prioritize certain packets, um, you know, these very mission critical services, autonomous cars, right? You don't want that video that your kids are watching to be what stands in the way of you getting the signal that around the corner is a deer and your self-driving car is gonna, you know, needs to slow down, right? So the other interesting point that Peter has made is, and it gets lost certainly inside the Beltway, not so much with the technical folks, but certainly with policymakers, is when you talk about prioritization, certainly in a 5G world, but I think otherwise, it doesn't mean that one packet all of a sudden gets stuck at the back, right? right. In favor exactly. or in lieu right. of another one. It just means there are certain types of packets that in their construction and in their design need to arrive in a certain way and at a certain time. And that's different than other packets. Not all packets require the same priority. So I just think it's really important, and I think we're all doing a good job, is, is to be really disciplined disciplined about the way in which we're talking about some of these issues, because I think over the years, things like, oh, paid priority, it's horrible, have been thrown around without a real understanding of what that actually means and what's at stake. So I'll get off my soapbox. I was the moderator. <laughs> this is back to the speakers. Um, 
Really, a question, uh, Tamara, for you, just again, in terms of, of being an operator, what are you seeing by way of you know, demand trends among your, your subscriber base in terms of like cool new apps that you guys see your, your customers really embracing without getting into any secrets? Right, well, I mean, I, I guess I'll just state the obvious that video continues to be a thing that just takes off and we, Every time we think we see things starting to slow down, they don't. I mean, all of our predictions on how much spectrum we would need, how much capacity would be taken up, they're always blown out of the water, which is part of that. You always need to have a robust spectrum pipeline because whatever is happening today, you need to be planning for five or 10 years down the road. I'm probably the last person to ask about particular apps. I mean, I could bring in my kids. <laughs> I, will say, I will say I'd give you one secret, machine learning. Yeah. That the transmission of data on machine learning, um, my members, my developers, uh, most of our developers are not spending their time writing the cute apps that you see on your phone. Mm -hmm. We've got 5,000 companies that we represent. They're making all of their money right now on gluing together um, business, uh, the CRM system with the just-in-time shipping, with the factory floor, with the delivery networks. Uh, everything from like, um, and I think you guys, I've seen some of this at your uh, display, uh, the idea of monitoring battery health on farm equipment so you know when the battery needs to be replaced. Tying that into the rotor router so that he shows up in between the window he says. If he gets a flat tire they can reroute another car. So networks are going to get slammed with a lot of uh, discrete small moments of data like that where there's going to be, where's the truck, where is the truck, where is this, what's going on, and that will all be pulled in into the cloud and pushed back out. So I know I've seen displays at Verizon that you guys have done on where you are on ag, and so uh, that video is going to be a hockey stick, but machine learning and the amount of data that that's going to require is going to have a profound impact on your network. Right, and certainly any of the smart or autonomous vehicles, I mean, that's a tremendous amount of data. I mean, that, that just boggles my mind how that's going to work. Um, but again, the FCC is doing a good job on continuing to put things in that pipeline, so we'll, we're hopeful about that. And the only limit really is the ingenuity of folks like you and the businesses and you know all our business customers and what they can do, what they can automate, what, how they can use big data. It's just endless. I want to circle back on um, a little bit of the conversation from the second panel, and that goes to you know, sort of this all is going to cost a lot of money. <laughs> and, and you know, some of the financial folks, you know, when they're talking about a lot of money, it's 100 million there. So to them, you know, the, these are not necessarily ginormous numbers, but for, for folks like us, those are really big numbers, and it really matters. So then the question is, how do you pay for all of this infrastructure build that has to happen and, and, and that needs to happen, and needs to happen in the relative near term to take advantage of, of the spectrum and get, the, get the, um, the, the capacity out there, without forcing the consumers to, to pay increasing bills? And so I, I know you have some thoughts here. What? Well, I think at the end of the day, consumers probably pay for everything at the, at the back end anyway, because we all buy stuff. But when I look at the CapEx spend that's necessary both for wireless and the wired backhaul and all of the other, the dig, the employment of all the wonderful union labor out there to, to work on this, you got to find the money somewhere. Right now, the only revenue source are the customers at the end of the line and I think that's going to end. There will be other revenue sources now machine to machine obviously. You're going to have those revenue sources coming in. And then the other thing is I think you're going to have advertising sources. Right now there is metadata and metadata that is tapped into and utilized for tremendous profit by Google and Facebook. I think that over time we're going to see that in this new world they don't have an inalienable right to only be the ones that tap into that data for advertising purposes. I think we're going to be able to see the companies also say, you know what, I've got some valuable data here. I don't have to raise my end user's rate per month from $50 to $200 or $250 because I have companies out here that will buy advertising and will market and it's just the world in which we're going to be operating and I think you'll see the rules change so it there'll be a blurring of the lines and you won't have just a couple companies out there today that are 
accessing the data for advertising purposes. I think you'll have other companies too. And that's a good thing because this infrastructure is so incredibly expensive, particularly in rural areas, that if you can't find other revenue resources, it will be delayed and we don't want to do that. So, so you raise rural, uh, but before we move well, on. Well, I think just, Jamie? you know, and, and I know that it's, it's a small piece of the pie, but when we're talking to policymakers, they don't, when they say, I, I would like, you know, $20,000 a year for you to put that box on that pole over there, you know, it's so important that we translate that back to the consumer, right? It, it's, it's, it's not, the money's not falling from the sky. It's going to come from somewhere. And to your point, consumers buy things and they pay for them. So I think that's a very important piece that I think gets lost in the discussion. And if you think about it from a healthcare perspective, just think about what the VA spends on health care because they have to bring people in to their offices. Think about now if a lot of the veterans live in rural areas, a whole lot of them live in one of the states we, my company used to serve, uh, West Virginia. Think about now if all of a sudden the VA can manage a whole lot of treatment remotely. Their costs drop dramatically and care goes up dramatically. So I do think we need to look at the economics of this in a new and different way. A data point brought to you by CTIA. <laughs> um, $305 billion in healthcare savings. Um, we commissioned a report by the report by Accenture, um, and that was the number. 305, I think it was Accenture, maybe Deloitte. Um, $305 billion in healthcare See, savings. Like, yeah. There you go. So can, can we talk a little bit about this issue of rural and cost? You know, obviously it's a, it's a huge priority. It has been a huge priority for lots of people around town and currently the, the FCC chair, which is how do we get more faster to areas that don't already have it? Uh, not to suggest that, you know, once you get outside the beltway, you have no coverage. That's not the case. So the question is, do you do any of you have thoughts about the relative role that 5G could play that maybe it's, it can get out there a little bit faster and maybe at a, at a better price point than maybe 3G or 4G? Or, or sort of is there a special promise that 5G holds for dealing with this, you know, rural, urban, I, don't, I hate to use divide, but. Well, I think um, a couple of things. Yes, you know, we're, we're starting in the more densified areas, right? I mean, you know, the small cells are not just being used for 5G, they're being used for densification of 4G as well. But, and it was mentioned earlier, but I, I do think there are, rural is a challenge, and I'll let my, my colleagues um, talk more in depth about um, the difficulty with the business case, but I do think there are opportunities in some rural areas in the shorter term, and you, you know, think about hospital centers, think about university campuses, um, Think about those those more densely populated areas in those inside those rural areas where I think there'll be some real opportunities in terms of 5G. I know it. You know, I've I've spoken to folks across the country, and um, it's a challenge. You know, they say, "Well, you're talking about 5G. What what about me?" And I get that. And and I think I will say this, and and I think at the risk of being master of the obvious, um, this is a problem that is everyone's problem. Mm -hmm. It's everyone's problem. And we all have to work together to get there. Well, I think, oh, you can go can next. I just, one thing that we shouldn't lose sight of is uh, universal service programs. I mean, the FCC mm -hmm. is going to move forward probably next year with the CAF auction, which is it's more like fixed broadband, but wireless providers can, if you meet the speed um, tiers, you just have to commit to a certain level of service. You can do it through wireless. And then following that, the mobility fund too. And I think what we shouldn't lose sight of is that, that the FCC has done, I think, a very good job on trying to find out exactly where broadband is and isn't. They have a lot going on with the mapping. I know all the mobile carriers, including us, are going to file new broadband maps in early January to show on a, now a standard basis where everybody knows what the inputs are, everyone's defining 4G LTE the same way, which has not happened before, to show where there is and isn't coverage by unsubsidized providers. And I think, you know, one of the things that we should, I mean, you want to do everything now, but at the same time, that's a, a pot of money that's going to be out there and it's going to be very targeted to where 4G isn't. I know that's 
not 5G, but you know, first things first. And I, I think um, that's going to be a very important step along the way because once you get the infrastructure there in those last few places, then that's a building block for 5G. And I, I want to re reinforce Jamie's point about rural areas. You have really two different issues. You have big spaces where there's nothing and getting coverage there is one thing. But there are also some very um, densely populated part. Like some rural areas are actually, the population is pretty dense, but they're all in this one little town or they're all in you know Billings or whatever it is in Montana. So that might be a very different solution. And that's where you know a 5G solution might come in sooner rather than later. So I see Sorry, a couple of things. You. No, no. Um, a couple of things. First of all, I, I think I probably come from the literal most rural place. And any, unless somebody's from Canada, I'm from the I'm from the most rural part of the America that you can get to, I'm from Alaska. And so, to your point, I grew up in an area where there's an urban center with a lot of people, but it's uh, 1,100 miles from my house to my grandfather's house, and the nearest town near mine is 400 miles. So I grew up about 80 miles south of the Arctic Circle. Um, what you end up with in that kind of environment, as you said, is these centers of interest where people come to, where they shop, where they do their things, and then people go out, we call them into the rotors, people who live at the end of the roads. Uh, and so you do have a penetration issue on those cases. But I think there's two things that from what I do here are worthwhile noting. We do an annual study of the app economy, and one of the things that we continually find is the myth that apps and the mobile app economy and the software economy is basically Silicon Valley in New York. False. 82% of the top mobile apps are made outside of Silicon Valley in New York. And in fact, they are made all over the place. There are software centers of excellence, if you want to think of it, uh, throughout. Financial services, uh, reinsurance, Nebraska, uh, Idaho. We have South Dakota with the folks who left Great Plains software, building amazing stuff. So there is an enormous amount of talent, skill that my members utilize from people all over the country. Um, Condé Nast has an app that's pretty popular. Uh, it was not built in New York. It was built by a guy, um, one guy in Virginia Beach, another who lives in Idaho, and one guy who did the graphics who's in a part of Texas where you have to get to with a four by. Those are the three <laughs> key programmers on this application. So they were rural. And so the lack of rural broadband harms their ability to provide software for everyone. Um, right now, we're at about 27 million underserved people on the broadband map that I think we need to get to. And so I know this is, this is probably not true for everyone on the panel, but we're big fans of the White Spaces Initiative. We think if you can, as you accurately described it, you said there are these gaps where there's literally no one. So there's no point in standing up anything there. If we can get the data further down the road to an urban center or to a farm or to some other place using TV White Spaces and then expand upon that there, that's something we need to look at. And so I think 5G, TV white spaces all fit together to get that coverage to roughly 27 million Americans who frankly would love to be a productive part of the uh, digital economy. So we're gonna, I'm going to ask one more question myself of the panelists, but then we're going to go ahead and turn to the audience. Uh, if you need them, we have little cards. We would just ask you to pen a question and they'll hand it to us and we'll go ahead and address it. Um, so last year when we did this very same conference, also with uh, the WTA, our focus was on 5G and smart cities. Five, you know, smart cities, huge focus for CTIA, I know, out at your show. Don't really hear anybody talking about it. So can you, it's not like that's not still happening. It's not like that's not still a focus. Can you guys share a little bit of color? What's, what's happening with the smart cities initiatives that were announced and were, were quite popular over the last couple of years? Still happening? Yeah, I mean, we're still doing it. We, we have our Boston program. Mm -hmm. We have our partnership, public-private partnership with Sacramento. And we're talking to other locations about doing the same thing or similar things. And we're making the pitch about all the things that you all have identified that we can, <laughs> that we can do. Um, and the, you know, the other side of that is, but we need to be able to get access to polls and rights of way and all that. So yeah, I mean, we're out there. Our state people are all over the place talking to mayors and other leaders about what, what, yeah. what and, they and can I think, get out of this. And I think the other thing that's happened is that, yes, smart cities, but this IoT machine to machine is yet another, you know, it evolves. What can we do with this spectrum that's really going to change things? So smart city is subsumed under mm -hmm. this 
IoT because when you're doing machine to machine, you're using it for highways, you're using it for Bridges. environmental applications, you're using it for hospitals, you're using it for diagnostic capabilities. You're using it for retraining people whose jobs are going to be lost because we're going to have more robots performing certain functions. So I think it's just a piece of the bigger pie. It's just we were defining it here and now we've said, wait, this is so much bigger than we originally envisioned. Yeah, and I think what's important to, to, to remember is that, you know, a lot of the elements or some of the elements of smart city are in place now. Yeah. You know, we keep talking about 5G and it's way in the future and we can't wait to get there. Um, but there's a lot happening right now in terms of, you know, crime safety. There's a, there's a community Gosh. city that um, actually uses wireless technology to identify a gunshot. They've reduced their uh, their firearms crimes by fifty percent. There are things you know as simple as um, smart grids in Florida Power and Light. Consumers are saving one hundred ninety one dollars a year um, due to what's happening with wireless technology. And again, I could go on and on because I love my stories and my data points. Um, but, but I think that's important because um, it's, it's, it's real time now, and that's why we're so anxious to get these little things out there um, because it's, it's, it's fueling. To, we want to fuel today. You know, we definitely want to fuel tomorrow, but we want to fuel today as well. I have a question. What do you all think, Kathleen, what do you all think is the most unusual IoT use that doesn't get described? We all hear, we always hear about refrigerator, we always hear about, the, you know, the obvious ones. What's the one that you think of is that nobody's really aware of on IoT? Probably surgery. Yeah. Mm. I think surgery I is, is say, an um, application that Southern, I... Southern Co. last year at this talked a little bit about, um, so they have excess capacity, right, during certain times of the day and mm -hmm. evening. They also um, owned a couple of uh, big warehouses in Atlanta. And what they did was they, came, they combined the sort of social dynamic of wanting to bring fresh food closer to urban, low-income neighborhoods with the ability to make use of these you know, old buildings with nothing going on. So they were growing food and they were able to use excess capacity at night with the electricity to use uh, the lights. And not only did that happen such that the food was available, but they also had, I guess, better produce because they didn't need the pesticides or anything else that you normally need for crops grown outside. So I thought that was, was really clever. And then the other they were doing was the same concept, but using excess power to, they had a, a piece of machinery that would sit in water and it would essentially help with the regeneration of power. So you didn't need to use as much power to, to do certain things. So I, I thought those, the way in which some of the utility companies who are you know, we don't really think of them as being in this space and, and thinking innovatively about how to use our technology to do different kinds of things, but they seem to be really pushing the envelope on some really interesting, not only business models, but applications. And I, I um, you know, Kansas City, I think, if, for folks who don't know, that's a place that's doing a lot with respect to smart city. What I found really interesting, it, it, it's not so much, you know, a, a terribly, you know, creative use of IoT, or what they're doing with IoT, but it's the result. So um, they put sensors in, so you know where, to, where there's parking, um, you can figure out when the street car's coming, what the traffic mm -hmm. patterns are, mm -hmm. you know, all the things that we are hearing about in other locations. But what I found incredibly interesting was that they're also using it for economic development because they are able to um, tell entrepreneurs what the foot traffic is in front of the empty storefront. So, you know, it, the things that we hear about, they're sort of common, you know, right. where's the parking space? But then you take that data and that information and you give it a little twist and you, and you help your economic development. I think that, that's a really interesting application. It's a great it goes to your example. advertising point. Yeah. Right. 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 It right. does. It right. goes to advertising. And guess we, what? All that's going to hammer the networks. I mean, that's coming back to a, I know. why we we'll even have this panel. Well. And that's a good thing. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's the part we all have to remember is, is we haven't even thought of all the different uses. I still love the example of, you don't even think about it, like when you have a big fleet of trucks managing when those batteries wear out or when you have to replace tires or when the oil change is happening. The fact that you can have a sensor in the battery that's like, help me, I'm dying. I mean, that's 
I spend a lot of my time in the healthcare space, so I know that's why those are my usually my favorite stories. But there's also those mundane things that just make your life better. Oh, and by the way, save millions of dollars of lost productivity. Right. Well, the other thing is on the energy side, uh, and I'm on an energy board, is <laughs> the energy demand has been going down for the past, and it will continue to decline because with all this information, everyone's using energy more efficiently, more mm -hmm. efficiently, more effectively. And that is huge, yep. especially when you have a number of states that have mandates about how much green energy they have to be using by X date. Uh, the fact that now people are managing their usage much more efficiently because the energy companies are much more efficient and because the weather forecasting is more efficient. I mean, it's, it just trickles down in ways that you wouldn't have thought about. Okay, any questions? Oh, a few questions. One question. All righty. Oh, dear. Um, excuse me if I don't get every word correct. Faced with increasing Chinese, European, Korean, and Japanese attention to the standards process, mm -hmm. can U.S. public policy spur U.S. participation for the U.S. to continue to derive benefit? I, in yeah, other words, in other how way, fast can we move even when, can when we we're still trying our global to do leadership standards? Here? Well, our folks are very involved in all the standards organizations, um, and we, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge thing, but I don't think the U.S. is so far behind at, at this point. We were way ahead on the 4G standards. We're participating in the 5G standards, Verizon in particular. Um, we've had um, our own uh, standards forum with uh, vendors and um, others, uh, and it's, I mean, it's something we're involved in every day. I don't think it's... I don't think the standards part is the part that is at risk. The part for us is, I think, the infrastructure part. It's the, I mean, in, I'm pretty sure in China, if the Chinese government wants something to happen, it's just going to happen right there, and there's no local <laughs> objection to it. So I think Jackie um, doesn't go to have to hand over 60, uh, uh, right. 60 ordinance. <laughs> right. Um, so I, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly not the expert on that, but I, uh, you know, I, I, all the U.S. operators are very involved in 3GPP and. Uh, those standards organizations. So, um, and as far as I understand, that things are going pretty well. I think the only area that there is some concern is is that um, our prod our companies have been such unquestioned leaders in the innovative space. We still make things in China, but a lot of the a lot of the think and the value and the machine learning especially is really being is really happening in the United States. I know there's some fear in our industry about. Um, Governments looking at standards processes, not so much in the 3G, uh, 5G PP space, but in others of, can I use this to do some kind of domestic innovation requirement? You think back to the Chinese decision around uh, Wi-Fi. I think, mm -hmm. I think there, that isn't always in the back of our minds is we don't want another Chinese Wi-Fi situation. So I think it, it, it behooves us to keep putting out good products. It's very helpful that uh, Verizon and AT&T and all the rest of the big companies sit on and are active in the standards bodies and participate. But I think that's, if I were to, if I were to intuit from that con question, I think that's really the, the issue is how do we make sure we don't end up with another Chinese Wi-Fi? And uh, I think we have to build better products and, and have companies like those stay active. And, and the other thing that's <coughs> important to appreciate is that we really develop and manage the whole global standard setting process, it's all private dollars. Yep. It's, right. So you need healthy companies to be active, to continue the growth in our markets so that we maintain leadership. This isn't uh, government driven from a US perspective. And that does mean that we are greatly dependent on all your members and yep. these companies to uh, to get out there and devote the resources, not just in the standard setting bodies, but in the ITU process. And that's a lot of money that companies spend that I think sometimes we forget about. So I think with that, we have gone <coughs> to the close of our session. I don't have a watch, but I think it's around 2.30. It is. Um, it is. Want to thank all of you for sticking with us through the day. I <coughs> just want to encourage you, if any of you who came in um, after the uh, first panel and have questions about the two small cells that are here, um, I think the executive from Mobility is here at least for a few more minutes, and you can go ahead and, and maybe ask him some questions. 
And then, um, as Peter is reminding me, yes, we will do closing remarks. But first, I want to, again, thank everybody here and thank this particular panel of speakers for joining us very, very much. It was very informative. Here you go. Well, I think this has been a great day. We've had close to 100 attendees. I don't know what the final count is, but that's a great showing. Um, I've been the executive, or I was the executive director of the Wireless Technology Association since the late 1990s. Um, but this year, we did a transition, and the new executive director is Emil Sterniolo of InStep Group, and he's going to make a few final comments. Thank you, Peter. Um, all I'd like to do is, uh, first, I'd like to thank Peter for the many years that he's uh, been at the helm and his stewardship uh, driving this organization forward. And I do appreciate uh, all of the work and effort he's put into helping me get this forum off uh, the symposium up and running today. Uh, thank you to the panel. Um, I guess, uh, in summary, I, I kind of, I was talking to one of the other uh, attendees today about, you know, this densification effort. And uh, we were looking at this and we we're basically saying, you know, if we were, went back about 100 years ago and somebody told you that they were going to put an electrical outlet every six feet in your home, um, you know, people would have said, you're absolutely crazy. Um, but uh, you know, if you liken this to that uh, metaphor, I mean, we are looking at better, closer uh, to the edge, uh, you know, communications here with being able to handle more and more people uh, with the wide diversity of applications that are coming in. So thank you. I really appreciate everybody coming. I uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Uh, hopefully we'll be doing this next year again. And uh, thank you. And hopefully you'll join us at the networking event across the street. And take care.